Just a quick note about me, a brief introduction. Um, I'm Thomas Much, I live in Hamburg, and as an Agile developer coach, I'll help teams sharpen their extreme programming skills, like pair programming and mob programming and so on. Um, and this way, I'm still coding Java myself, and this is where MapStruck comes in. Some time ago, I was sitting over a glass of beer together with uh, Gunnar, and um, we were talking about Hibernate OGM, one of his projects. Um, and on a different topic, I was lamenting about uh, lots of mapping code I had to write um, for a current project. And he said, wait, don't do this. We have a small project we will release soon, and that will help you a lot. And today I use Mapstruct in several of my projects, and uh, today I'd like to tell you about that. So remember, I'm not the author of Mapstruct, I'm just a user, a fanboy, and the messenger for Mapstruct. So, bean mapping. What are beans? What are Java beans? Uh, some history. Uh, I suppose most of you know what Java beans are. Two years after Java was released to the public, um, we got the Java bean specification. That is, we've got a certain structure for our classes. You know that private uh, fields, setters and getters. Um, we used that for UI construction at that time. Um, nowadays, I think most of you just uh, need the property, the, the property structure of the classes. And then came the web frameworks, like struts. Um, someone used struts here? that time? Yeah, ah, one third. <laughs> so we had to use, f we had to write form beans that were essentially Java beans um, that had the structure of Java beans. And then came the time of J2EE, Java 2 Platform Enterprise Edition. And we went through s uh, something that we called the DTO hell. Um, we had to write lots of DTOs. Someone suffered the DTO hell? Ah. Some old Java coders here. Yeah, that wasn't nice, um, but we survived it somehow because in 2000, someone said, hey, what we're doing there isn't really great. We are uh, binding our domain entities to our technology, and we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't put the technology in the center of our work, but the domain. And he said, just let's use uh, plain old Java objects, plain ordinary Java objects, POJOs, and they were beans with setters and getters and private fields. After that, many more beans were invented, like JXB entities, JPA entities. We're using that since uh, Java Enterprise 5 or Spring was invented in between uh, and used Hibernate and JPA, um, and we're using that as well. But it took roughly 10 years to bring us a type-safe and fast way of mapping data between all those entities. We have, sometimes we have to copy the data between those entities, and it took only 10 more years to uh, bring us a tool for fast and type-safe bean mappings. Rewind to the year 2000. Let's look at an old system architecture, J2EE style. Yeah? Um, we've got the database, um, a three-layer architecture. We've got the database, we've got the backend, and we are uh, loading the uh, data, the data as entity beans from our database. Worked somehow, but we could use the entity beans only in the backend. They were tied to EJB technology, and we, when we wanted to pass the data from the backend to the front end, we had to copy the data into data transfer objects. Yeah, yeah. So we did that, uh, we did this, and then in the front end, depending on the framework we used, we had to copy the data again into something like view beans, form beans, any beans that were tied to the front end technology. So for a quite common architecture, we had classes that had the same structure two or three times or maybe more, and we had to copy the data between them. Then came spring. Java Enterprise 5, and they promised us something. They said, hey, we've got JPA. Why don't you use your JPA entities from the back end and pass those entities to the front end? Um, you can do that. JPA entities aren't tied to the technology. It's just annotations. They aren't used in the front end. Pass the entities to the front end. There you go. You need one class and not more. 
great. Uh, it should work in theory, and you can do this, but if we look at reality, it might look different today. Yeah? Okay, you, you can do this. We've got the database, we've got our JPA entities, and sometimes we really just pass the JPA entities from the back end to the front end, um, and we're happy. But we've got different systems. Maybe we've got a host system, yeah? a Kobo mainframe or something like that. And if we're lucky, they can, uh, they can communicate via XML. But then we have to provide some JAXB entities and uh, send the data to the host. Or uh, current architectures with uh, REST entities for JSON transport, we want to uh, have mobile clients. Uh, who doesn't want to have mobile clients these days? So maybe we have some more domain objects that we have to copy the data to. And even DTOs, data transfer objects, are used. Depending on the layer you are using, maybe some view beans if you have some old uh, web front end, front end. There are lots of entities, entity classes, and we still have to copy the data. So this is reality, and this might look like some um, legacy architecture grown over the years, but it has some relevance to modern architecture. Is any one of you doing domain-driven design? Ah, one. That's great. Or uh, maybe hexagonal architecture. Um, there we have different systems with different domain models and we want to separate them. If we have one bounded context, one system, and we've got one domain model, we don't want to expose this domain model to the second system, the second service, um, because of security reasons, because of um, system in uh, independence. We want to deploy the systems independently, for example. Then we can't couple the systems by um, an entity model that can change. Um, if this model changes, um, and both systems have to change, that's bad. So we want to separate those systems. We have to put a layer in between domain-driven design calls, this, the anti-corruption layer or ports and adapters. We have a transport model, a transport layer with certain classes, and we have to copy the data from the domain model to this transport model and on the other side, vice versa. So this is relevant to today's architecture styles. We have to copy data between entities. Let's have a look at some concrete classes. On the left side, there's a JPA entity, a customer. We are running an e-commerce site. And the customer has an ID, a database ID, a customer ID, a name, and some title. Um, and I omitted the getters and setters. And on the right side, some kind of DTO. This can be our JSON entity, our XML entity, whatever. And in this DTO, I have different data types like uh, the primitive long, not the wrapper. Um, the customer ID is of type string, not long. Ah, the name I can copy directly, it's string. The title is an enum. Here it's a string. So I have to map the data. I just don't have to copy it. I have to map the data between different data types. And I have to do certain checks because there's a um, wrapper class and I might have uh, to do some null checks if I want to convert it into a primitive law. That's a common use case for mapping between um, entities or between beans. But this was only one mapping between customer and customer DTO, and it was bidirectional. Yeah, I had to provide two mappings. But what if, uh, if I want to map this to a JSON entity or to a REST entity? All those mappings can become quite tedious if I have to write the mapping code myself by hand. Yeah. Okay, I exaggerated a little bit, but if you have to write the mapping code, it can become tedious. What can you do? How can we implement the mapping code a little bit easier than just manually? You can do it yourself. You can write the mapping code by hand, but that's cumbersome. Um, I've seen lots of projects that, ha that have written um, their own reflection libraries, mapping libraries between their entity models. It works, but it's built in-house. Nobody else has knowledge about this. There are special, special solutions, um, and there are reflection libraries. Of course, you can use the existing reflection libraries for copying data. That's um, BeanUtils or Dozer. Um, does someone use Dozer or BeanUtils? Yeah. So, 
uh, some of you, okay? Um, they're quite common, but they use reflection. And uh, writing mapping code by hand and using reflection has uh, some drawbacks. Um, if you're writing the mapping code by hand, you have manual effort. Um, I've seen projects also recently that write all the mapping code by hand. You can do this, but it's tedious. And if you use mapping, uh, if you use reflection, you have missing type safety and performance issues. If you use reflection and um, don't care about um, the how the reflection is done, it's easy to uh, lose data, lose precision. Um, maybe you get uh, runtime errors because you don't catch the, type, the missing type safety at compile time. Now you're mapping an uh, enum to a long, there's no mapping and it crashes at runtime and you don't get an idea at compile time. And we've got performance problems. It isn't that much, much of an issue today. Uh, reflection has become faster, but it's still slower than direct method calls. Speaking of performance, someone has made a comparison between Dozer and handwritten code and MapStruct. And if you have a look at the orange line, that's the Dozer. Um, and the more objects we have to conver convert, the slower it a reflection becomes. It's not that slow, but it's significantly slower than the uh, handwritten code, which is the green line at the bottom. Can everybody see the green line at the bottom? No, you don't see it because it's hidden um, by the map struct line, the blue line. That means map struct code is as fast as handwritten code. Yeah, it's code that you might have written yourself, it's just plain Java calls, it's fast. So here comes MapStruct. What is MapStruct? MapStruct is an annotation processor that generates the mapping code. It doesn't use reflection, it's type saved, it's fast, we've seen this just before. Um, and you can see the generated code and you will see it's readable, it's understandable. Um, you can even put it under version control if you don't trust the generator. Yeah, but it's a small, easy tool that just works. It requires at least Java 6, but with the forthcoming release of Java 9, that shouldn't be a problem today. We've got special support for Java 8, repeatable annotations, for the example. And we've got a minimal runtime dependency that's less than 20 kilobytes. And if you happen to use CDI, you don't have any runtime dependency at all. So that's a non-invasive, little, cool tool that we'll have a look at. Which versions are there? Uh, version 1.0 was released um, two years ago. Um, 1.1 is rock solid, it's used in production, and today I'll be talking about MapStruct 1.2, which is still in beta, um, but it's um, solid, you can use it. Um, we'll see some of the features of MapStruct 1.2. How do you use it? There are some um, jar dependencies you have to include in your project. That is um, the um, base archive, which brings some annotations and um, the minimal runtime dependency if you don't use CDI or any other dependency injection container. And we'll have the MapStruct processor. And this annotation processor is only required during compile time. You don't need it to deliver in your deployable application. So. Very little jars, small jars, and it's quite easy to set that up. Let's have a look again at our example. We've seen the customer on the left side, the JPA entity, and on the right side, the customer DTO, and we we'll want to create the mapping from the JPA entity to the DTO. Um, Unidirectional, uh, just one direction, um, should be enough for the first step and see how that works. Our task is to map all of the properties, including superclasses, if there were any, um, to the right side. Okay, how are we gonna do that? Make a wish. So, we just write an interface, and if you see this interface customer mapper, it's common to call it like the base entity and then mapper, and I just write a signature, like um, I have a customer some entity, and I want a customer DTO. I give it any name I want, and that's it. Hard to believe? Ah, we have to put in some more code. We have to put in some 
magic. That's the mapper annotation of mapstruct. I say, this is a mapstruct mapper, and I'm going to use CDI as a component model. I don't have to say on every place that I will use CDI as a component model. I can configure it um, in some system properties. Then I have, don't have to repeat it on every mapper. Um, but mainly that's all, and then I can use this mapper. I can just let it inject by CDI, and then I can use this mapper, mapper custom to DTO, and I, ca I get this entity mapped to my DTO. Wow. But it's just an interface. It's not an implementation. This core needs an implementation. How are we go uh, going to generate this? Generation is quite easy. You just click on Save uh, in your IDE. Yeah? Just click Save, and then the generator will work. More precisely, the Java compiler has to run. Um, the Java compiler will tell the annotation processor to start working, and then the annotation processor will generate the source code, which the compiler will compile into bytecode. That is, every time, every time you save, the, uh, ma the annotation processor will generate the suitable mapping code for your beans. Of course, it won't, won't generate every time, every classes. It looks what has changed. But every time you save your code or the compiler runs, the code will be generated. Okay, and that we'll see live. That's the right one. Yeah, I, I use Eclipse. Uh, I hope that's okay. <laughs> nah, <laughs> won't, won't switch it in the next five minutes. Um, is it large enough, uh, enough for everyone to see? Okay. So this is the example that we just saw. I've got the customer. Um, here we have the getters and setters. Um, it isn't optimized, optimized for um, productive JPA. It's just... Um, plain customer with um, properties, um, that's enough for us here. Then I've got the DTO. Just a reminder, just the ID is of type long. Everything else I made as a string, that's enough for the first step. Yeah? We just want to map between different data types. And now comes the mapper. Um, if I want to implement the mapper, let's have a look what's there. There's the customer mapper, no implementation, ah, but, but I've got a test, a unit test. Let's have a look at that. A small unit test. I hope everyone is able to understand this quick enough. Uh, I set up a customer um, and I want to test the mapping code and I want to assert that enums, the title is an enum, is converted into, um, uh, into a string. Uh, I put in an enum value and I want to make sure that it's converted correctly into a string. Just a small test. Let's run this test. Mm. Oh, it fails and it says, um, cannot find implementation for mapper, custom mapper. I think the unit test is right, the implementation is missing. So now let's annotate our mapper, and I use uh, the mapstruct mapper, and yeah, I tell him to use the component model, um, and he can help me. I've installed the um, mapstruct eclipse plugin, and it can provide some auto-completion, for example, for the component model and for properties that we will, we, uh, that we will, we will be using, and I'll choose CDI as the component model. So, I've uh, saved, oh, you didn't see this, I click save, and now let's have a look at the test, I run the test, and wow, it's green. The mapping code must be there somehow. Yeah, let's have a look. There it is, custom mapper implementation, and we'll see that this is generated code. Um, it uses the generated annotation, and um, it tells when the code was generated, uh, which version of uh, Mapstruct we used for the generation. And if you want to put the generated code under version control, you can suppress these attributes. Uh, if you really don't trust Mapstruct um, that it will work in five years, um, suppress 
the date and comments attributes and put it under version control and you're safe. Yeah? I use this tool for some years now. I never felt like I had to put this under version control. It just works. But if you feel safer, you can put it under version control. Otherwise, it's quite re readable code. Um, it's application scoped. It's a CDI bean. We can inject it. Um, and if you have a look at the implementation, it implements our mapper interface. And now we have an implementation for the customer to DTO method. We have null checks. Um, we create the DTO. We have the setter um, with string value of. We have null checks for the, for the properties. Um, we have a date conversion. I'm not sure if you saw that I used um, a date for the last login of the user. And uh, MapStruct uses by default the simple date format to convert between date and string. Uh, we'll see in a moment how we can control this a little bit um, in detail. Um, but it's readable code. It's code that you would write by hand. Okay. Ah, and it's uh, thread safe. Yeah? You can call this within your threads. You don't have any problems with threads. Um, it just works. Now, um, we've got CDI, we've got appli an application scope bean. What if uh, we don't have CDI or Spring AutoWire um, components? Um, what if we don't use um, an injection container? We can use this. I can... Um, leave out the component model, or I can um, just use the default component model. Now the generated code um, omits the application scoped. How do we get our instance of the mapper? And there's a common pattern, and the common pattern says, well, then um, provide a mapper instance within your interface and ask MapStruct for the right mapper. Mappers, get mapper, um, customer mapper.class. And then we can just say customer mapper.instance and can call the mapping codes directly. And actually, that's what I'm doing in the test. If I want to write a unit test, I can call mappers, get mapper, or I can call customer mapper.instance if I have provided such an instance. It works in every environment you can think of. Okay, I remove um, the instance variable again. We don't need it because I want to stick with uh, CDI. And the generated code has switched to application scoped again. Okay, um, we did see that the unit test was green. That's great. Now, we've got the DTO. Um, we still have to write our entities and our DTOs or whatever we like. And some people say this is too much boilerplate code. I don't need this. Um, a DTO is an anemic object. It just transports data from A to B. Why do I have to have all these setters and getters? Just let's make these um, fields public. That's just a transport structure. I don't need all the rest. I'll delete this. Um, I usually don't use this, use this, but um, there are some use cases, and I've seen this in projects, a DTO with public fields, it's okay. Now let's have a look at the generated code. We saved, uh, I saved the code, and um, MapStruct has generated the code to use direct field access, which is okay for DTOs. Um, I don't use it that much myself, um, but you can use it if you want. Okay. I revert that again. I want to have real Java beans. And again, if I save this, the mapping code is regenerated. Okay, now we want fast mapping, we want type safe mapping. Um, let's see um, if I say this enum value, um, the title isn't mapped to a string, but to a um, long. See if we can do this. I get some compiler errors. Uh, it's a little bit small, but maybe you can see it. Um, cannot convert from long to string. Um, hmm. 
Ah, okay, I had to save. Um, can't map property um, to long. The title is an enum. Uh, map struct can't map this to long. It could, of course, but it won't do because it's unsafe. It doesn't know what the correct mapping between enums and long values is. We could use the ordinal value of an enum, but I think that's quite dangerous, so we don't use it. So I get compile time errors when something isn't working in my mapping code. Whenever I change my entities or my mapper and I just recompile my projects, I get compile time errors when my mapping code, my generated mapping code, isn't working anymore. That's great. We don't have to test it run on runtime. I get the errors really early. We could provide a mapping. I'll leave it out for now. We could provide a, um, a mapping and then we could customize this. But I just wanted to, uh, to show you type safety when doing mapping. Now, um, this was like an ideal world. My entity and my DTO have the same properties with the same names. That's uncommon. We have different names in my entities and my DTOs. Let's say the customer ID, I rename it to um, customer number. Yeah. So I've renamed it and suddenly MapStruct sees we've got an unmapped target property. Now I have um, the customer number and this is a field in the DTO and MapStruct sees that this field won't be filled with data on mapping. And it says, take care, you've got a DTO field that won't receive any data. Okay, what are we going to do about this? First of all, it's a bit hard to see. Ah, you can see it. We've got a yellow line underneath, and it says there's something, there's a warning. And I can get a um, quick fi fix um, from the uh, Eclipse MapStruct plugin, and it says, um, well, just ignore this property. Huh? I'll save and everything's fine. So um, we suppressed the warning. Um, I don't know if you uh, use check style, and I like these developers um, that uh, um, delete uh, um, check style warnings just by suppressing them. I don't think that's a good idea. And so if you get the warning that um, some field isn't filled, you should take care and probably not ignore it. But you can ignore it. Better is. Um, we've got the target property, customer number in the customer DTO. If I, says, if I say the source property is um, not customer number, but customer ID. The warning disappears and my code is generated um, that customer ID is taken and copied into customer number. Um, I think uh, I'll show you again, uh, we take customer ID and put it into customer number. Um, from now on, I think you believe me that MapStruct will generate the code. Yeah, okay. So um, we can map, we can map um, different names uh, onto each other. Um, that is, we have to just provide some mapping and all the tedious code will be generated. Now, um, we've seen the um, last login date, a timestamp, um, dealing with Dates and times and timestamp is quite difficult and you shouldn't use default values because default values mean we're using system defaults and that, that's not predictable. Um, so we can use, if I want to have uh, a mapping for my last login, that's the target, last login. Um, the name is the same so I don't need um, a source. And now I want a date format. I want to tell him, please use, um, in Hamburg, we use uh, this format. Please use this date format. And have a look. Ah, I'll show you the generated code once again. Yeah? It uses a simple date format with a pattern I just provided. So um, I can control on every property which date, time, or timestamp format one has, uh, one, um, the map I shall use. And this works not only with um, Java Util Date and Calendar, that's old style. It works with Joda Time, it works, uh, works with uh, Java 8 Date and Time, and you can convert between them. And uh, whenever suitable, it uses UTC or the system um, time zone. We don't have to care about, we just have to provide patterns if we we're con converting between um, the objects, the time objects, and strings. Okay. 
So um, that's the basic mapping, and I think this already is quite impressive. But uh, this is no real-world uh, example because um, you usually don't have a single object, but a graph of objects, references in your objects. Now, um, my customer probably has an address, yeah, and I put the address in here. Um, I generate some getters and setters. Get address, set address, yeah. And um, I have the DTO. We don't get a warning because there's no field for the address yet in the DTO. And now I have the um, address DTO. I've uh, provided the classes beforehand. Yeah, address, address with double D. And I call it address just like in the entity. Um, I generate getters and setters. Um, get address, set address. So now my customer and customer DTO have object references. Yeah? And there is my mapper. What do I have to do to let MapStruct generate the, the mapping code for the addresses? Have a guess. Save. I, I've saved already. You're right. Yeah? <laughs> You're right. I just have to save. Um, and if we look at the implementation, first of all, there's uh, this um, address to address DTO method, and um, MapStruct is going to use it uh, in its generated mapping code. So um, MapStruct is trying to map all the object hierarchy um, that my entity model and DTO model provides. Of course, I can control this, but it's as easy as this, um, and it's 80-20 uh, um, or 90-10% usage. Uh, most of the time, it will do the right thing. Um, if, I want, if I don't want MapStruct to generate this code, I can take it out of automatic uh, generation, and I just disable the method generation. Okay? Now I get a warning um, that address can't be mapped. He's right, I just um, disabled the generation, so now there is no mapping code, and he sees um, that the entity has an address, it should be mapped, I didn't ignore it, so there's no code, I get an error, I can't uh, compile this. Um, now what, can, uh, what I can do is um, quite easy, I can write it by hand, or I can let me help by the Eclipse plugin, um, I just um, provide another another signature uh, from address to address DTO, and then again um, the source code will be generated. Yeah, so either MapStruct generates everything itself, or I can provide signatures, abstract signatures for all the mappings that I want to have. Now, um, this works, but. Um, I'm a friend of separation of concerns. I don't think that a customer mapper should take care of mapping addresses. Yeah? So I want to take um, the address TTO mapping method out and want to put it in a different, uh, in a different mapper. Um, that's the address mapper. I'll put the mapping code here, and we make, make a, a mapstruct mapper out of it. So there we are. Let's have a look. Address mapper, uh, address mapper impl, the generated code is there. But I still have an error. Um, the customer mapper still can't map the address because it's a different mapper now. But it's easy again. I can just say, uh, please use uses um, address mapper dot class and it's an error I can use as many mappers as I want and the compiler error is gone because now the um, implementation the generated implementation um, gets the address mapper injected and uses it now this is quite interesting because if I don't use CDI uh, I switch back to the default model Um, what's happening 
um, under the hood is um, that um, the address mapper is uh, taken from a mapstruct with mapstruct get mapper. But what if um, address mapper isn't a mapstruct mapper, but some legacy code you already have in your project, which happens? Yeah, you have or, most probably you ha already have some mapping code. Um, so let's just mapstruct reuse this code. I remove the mapping annotation. It's no a mapstruct mapper, and see what the um, no, maybe I have to save this mapper. Mm. Something's not right. Ah, yeah, uh, he can't instantiate this mapper. Why? Um, now this is just an interface, and nobody's providing an interface for it. Yeah? Okay. He's, of course, um, Eclipse is right. So let's make a class out of it. And I can make an abstract class out of it. Um, then, then again, Mapstruct couldn't instantiate it only if I had a mapping annotation um, provided. Abstract. So, it works. Interface or abstract class doesn't matter. But now, if this is existing mapping code, this is just a normal class without mapper. And, of course, now I have to provide my mapping code. Yeah. This is your custom mapping code, and we'll just return um, an address DTO. So, uh, um, if you're working with really legacy code, maybe you have a public static converting method. Yeah? Um, now, and let's have a look at the code. Um, it just works. Yeah? Mapstruct generate codes, generates code that uses our legacy mapping code. So we can integrate generated code with our existing code base. It's that easy. Okay. Now, um, 12 minutes left, that's okay. Um, I just remove this disable sub-method generation because I have provided an implementation. Now, I cannot only map objects for the first time, but maybe I've got a DTO and I refreshed my entity from the database and I have to update my DTO with a refresh data from the database. It's a common pattern in Java Enterprise applications when we pass data uh, to the front end and back. And I don't have to write that code by hand. I just can say I have a method uh, update customer DTO and I'll update it from a customer. Yeah, this is um, a freshly loaded customer and I want to update an existing DTO. And this is where I can put an annotation um, mapping target in here and that's my DTO. Oh, my customer DTO. And now I get some mapping code generated that takes this DTO and copies the data from the customer into the DTO, but it doesn't generate a new object. It just doesn't say new customer DTO. So I can update existing code. But now we've got an unmapped target property customer number. Yeah, that's right, because I changed customer number from customer ID. So now I could use this mapping, write it again, and um, Mapstruct will be happy. That's cumbersome. That's repeated coding. I don't like that. Yeah? What, what are we going to do? Of course, there's a solution. We just have to inherit the configuration. And it takes the nearest configuration it can find, or I can provide a name and say, please use this method named so-and-so and use the mapping configuration. And if that's ambiguous, I get a compile error. Yeah. OK. So updating um, beans. Now, that was just um, one-way mapping. Usually, we have to do mapping in both directions, uh, from the front and back to our entities. What are we going to do? Make a wish again. Um, I want to have a customer, and now I have a DTO to a customer. And that's my customer DTO. Okay. 
The code is generated, but again, I've got an unmapped target property because the names are different. What am I going to do? I'll inherit the configuration. But if I just say inherit configuration, it won't work because we're doing it the other way around. Now I've had to, uh, I have to inherit the, um, inverse, uh, the inverse configuration. Yeah. R red doesn't, uh, that's not as bad because he says, now I've got two possible methods that provide a mapping configuration. My mapping, my creating, creating, creation mapping method and the update mapping method. Um, I've got two methods and I have to tell MapStruct which configuration to use and this time I have to use this name and everything's fine again. Now I get all the mapping code in both directions without writing a single line of implementation. I think that's quite cool. Okay, one last, uh, one last thing of live coding. Um, what else should you see? Um, what we've seen um, about um, object graphs, we can extend to uh, collections of entities. Um, in JPA models, we have uh, one-to-many or many-to-one associations, and that's lists and sets, and MapStruck can convert between those lists. Um, we just make a wish and everything's going to work. Um, but I want to, you to show that um, MapStruct is more than just bean mapping. It's data conversion between data types. And I create another mapper. Um, oh, let's take an interface. And um, I make a spoiler. I call it a stream mapper, uh, stream collection mapper. Okay. Now it's a map struct mapper again. And now let's say I want to have a list of longs. Oh, and this is a Java util list. And I want to con convert an array to long. Well, maybe you've got some legacy code that works with arrays. We've learned tomorrow morning that arrays might still be very useful for performance, but um, in data models, Arrays are uncommon these days. Um, so maybe you, you want to uh, convert an old data model arrays to long. And now I've got an uh, integer array. Um, and I want to have a list of longs. Stream collection mapper implementation. There it is. And we get the implementation for array to long. We've got night checks. Um, a suitable implementation is chosen um, and it's populated with all the values. Um, it's converted. Maybe we've got some data loss here. Uh, we have loss of precision. There will be an option in future, future versions of MapStruct uh, to get a warning in this case, but we can just make any wish what we want to have conver converted and MapStruct will generate the code. Um, this was list and array. You can do this with a set um, and of course, let's say we have a set of strings, and um, I want an enum, and this enum is a string, uh, is a stream of my title enums. Okay, and again, MapStruct generates this code. The stream is mapped to the enum title name and then collected into a hash set, and the other way around. Um, uh, if you like that. So you can make any wish uh, for data conversion and most of the time MapStruct will be able to generate this code. So um, five minutes left, some roundup. Um, everything I've shown here you will get on the slides um, so you don't have to follow the uh, stream again. And so I can skip the slides for the live coding. Uh, um, jump to this slide. There's a lot more we haven't seen exception handling, we haven't seen object factories, we haven't seen um, uh, hooks or callbacks we can hook into mapping generation before and after mapping. There's a lot more you can see in the documentation. We've got build tool integration. Um, I've shown it here by hand, uh, that was a manual Eclipse configuration, it, it works. 
Um, Mapstruct uses a Java compiler service provider interface. You just put the jar on the, on the class path in Java C. The Java compiler recognizes the annotation processor. And of course, you can integrate it into Maven, Ant, and Gradle. And you find setup um, instructions in the documentation. Um, the Eclipse plugin, we've seen we've got some quick fixes. We've got, um, got code completion. That's really helpful. Um, I think we could use some volunteer for IntelliJ. Okay. What's new in Mapstruct 1.2? We've seen lots of features, just that you can see what you uh, could use with Mapstruct 1.1 and Mapstruct 1.2. Support for Java 8 streams is uh, the new version. Uh, public fields are supported in the new version. Um, the automatic generation of sub uh, mapping methods is in the new version. And we've got integration with Project Lombok. Um, so does someone of you use Project Lombok? Ah, one third, half. OK. Um, it works together. Um, you should use um, the Maven, uh, a Maven POM that it works together because there's some um, nifty tricks going on under the hoods. And, um, but they have managed to um, bring it uh, together that um, Mapstruck can see what Lombok generates. Uh, the idea of Lombok is to um, skip all the getters and setters and let the getters and setters generate by one annotation. Uh, that's Lombok in 10 seconds. Um, and it was quite difficult to bring um, several annotations process, annotation processes together, but we've got support for this in the upcoming release. And support for Java 9, that's experimental. Um, it's um, mainly you have to declare what modules to use for the generated annotation. So a quick recap. Um, Mapstruct meets cur uh, real world current needs for bean mapping. I use it in several of my project projects and it just works. Um, the generated code, you can read it, it's understandable, it's fast, um, and you can even put it on a version control. Um, we've got flexible mappings. I've shown you some of them. you find a lot more in the documentation, um, and you can integrate it with any of your component models. And what's great for an open source project is the extensive and well-written documentation. Um, it's easy to read, easy to understand, if you've, even if you've got some special use cases. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, you're speaking of immutable objects. Yeah. Um, that isn't supported out of the box yet. There's an open ticket for this, but um, if you've got final uh, fields, final variables, you usually have a builder to populate these. Um, uh, to po populate these fields. If you don't have, um, you have to have a builder at the moment. And then you can let Mapstruct, uh, Mapstruct map from an entity to the builder, and the builder can then populate the fields. I think it's not possible at the moment to have a final fields and a constructor. Um, y you can provide code for this, but it um, boils down to writing too much code by hand. I think um, if you have a builder, you can let Mapstruct um, map from entity to builder and then generate the immutable object. That's the way I would choose for now. Okay. No, uh, because we just we don't use it. Um, just uh, with persistence. Um, I've used um, MongoDB with Amorphia. There's a mapper, uh, there's a special mapper. You can use uh, Hibernate for mapping to, uh, to the database, but between all those models, we have no mappers. Yeah? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think um, it's persistence only. You've got a persistence model, and we've got other models, and we have to map between them. Okay, my time is over. Thank you, but first of all, before I finish, thanks to the developers of Mapstruct. I'm a user of this library. Um, I think it's great. Thanks to Gunnar, the original author of the project. He's here. He will be talking next in this slot, uh, in this room, about bean validation. Um, thanks to Andreas, Jak, and Philip. Um, a great, small, great product. Thank you. And thanks to you all for listening.